Rachel Cletus is with the Union of Consent Writers, of which I am also a member. Um, uh, based in US, the UCS has had a similar focus to use science to address some of the most pressing global problems. And they've been active at this for 50 years. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, Rachel is the policy director with the Climate and Energy Program uh, at the UCS. Uh, this program is intended to uh, design effective and equitable policies to address climate change and to advocate uh, for their implementation. Uh, as always, the first part of the session today is going to be a presentation by Rachel, and after that, we'll have a QA and a session. Uh, you can type your questions uh, anytime during the Zoom chat. And those of you joining us via Facebook Live, please type your questions there and we'll take it up uh, during the Q&A session. Okay, Rachel, thank you again for joining us and the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. It's such an honor and pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm gonna start sharing my screen and hopefully um, I'll be able to do that without any technical glitches. Um, yep. I'm hoping you all can see the slides and I'm gonna put this in the slideshow mode so you can see the slides. So I'm gonna start with a confession. I'm not the kind of climate scientist that maybe some of you thought. Uh, I'm an economist and I've been working on these issues of climate change for about 20 years now, uh, 14 of them with the Union of Concerned Scientists. and. Uh, from the very beginning, for me, this has been a profound interdisciplinary challenge, a really exciting challenge in some ways because it brings together all these different streams of uh, uh, expertise, but also uh, a daunting one. Uh, this is a marathon, uh, it's not a sprint, uh, but we are running out of time uh, to help limit some of the most profound climate impacts. We're seeing them all around us today already uh, and if we fail to take strong action to curtail our heat trapping emissions, uh, these impacts are going to worsen. And one of the key pieces uh, for me that's been very important is uh, recognizing the fact that climate change has always been about an equity challenge. Because even though climate change is affecting us all, uh, it is no doubt having a disproportionate impact on those who live in poverty around the world, here in the United States, as well as in India, everywhere in the world, we see these disproportionate impacts. And today I was invited to talk about climate change, especially how do we think about this challenge, a crisis that we already knew uh, was underway, even as we face one of the most profound public health crises that the world has seen. Um, so, just before I got on this uh, webinar this morning, uh, I, I was on the Johns Hopkins uh, website looking at the latest uh, numbers around um, the COVID tracking around the world. And you can see uh, we are in a very, very profound uh, crisis. We've got over 12 million cases around the world, uh, over a half million deaths. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, early efforts to curtail uh, this public health crisis by implementing very stringent lockdowns, including in India, um, are, are, haven't had the effect that we had hoped for. We're now seeing a resurgence in many parts uh, of the world, including the US, uh, and places where, frankly, uh, the virus is just uh, on the upswing. Uh, there isn't even a first wave, a, a second wave, we're still in the first wave. So how do we, in a moment like this, uh, still retain focus on other crises that exist? And I guess what I would like to point out today is that we've never had the luxury of picking just one crisis. We live in a multi-dimensional world. We have a range of these problems coming at us. And right now we've got at least three. We've got the COVID-19 crisis, the climate crisis that never went away, and we have a burgeoning economic crisis around the world. So that's the challenge part. That's the daunting challenge part. What I would like to posit though is we have solutions that actually work across all these crises. Uh, so on the solution side, the silver lining is many of the solutions that help protect health and well-being can also be solutions that help us lower carbon emissions and build climate resilience. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today 
because this is not a moment to back down on climate action. This is actually a moment to lean into climate action even as we confront these other crises. Um, and thank you so much, Ritika, for uh, introducing the Union of Concerned Scientists a bit. Uh, I feel like I don't have to say too much more, except maybe one thing, which is that we've always believed for the 50 years of our existence that facts matter, uh, science matters, and science doesn't just belong in the ivory tower. Ordinary citizens around the world, armed with the best available science, are in the best position to advocate for the kind of changes they would like to see in the world, to put pressure on policymakers, uh, to educate others. And you all are part of that uh, global network of folks who are uh, moved to do this kind of work. So I really appreciate uh, what you are doing through this consortium that you've created. Um, just to start a little bit, many of you have probably seen headlines like this. They're now making the news weekly, if not daily. Uh, some new uh, uh, effect of climate change that is evident in the world here and now. And that's the most important thing. It's already here. You just need to look around you in your backyard. You're probably seeing these impacts, whether it's worsening heat waves, uh, whether it's uh, water crises, uh, uh, whether it's worsening flooding. And in all of these cases, climate change is a risk multiplier. It's a threat multiplier. So yes, we've always had cyclones, we've always had hurricanes, uh, we've always had heat waves, but now climate change is amplifying the risk. Um, and at, at any given time around the world, we're seeing very, very profound shifts. Uh, this is data from 2019 uh, that NOAA in the United States put together. And you can see that all around the globe, we've seen these so-called anomalies where uh, our warming temperatures are contributing to really profound shifts. I'll bet, just pick one, for example, uh, tropical cyclone Idai, uh, which hit the western coast of Africa uh, last March, a very, very deadly, uh, uh, intense uh, cyclone of the kind that was really unprecedented. And then weeks later, we had cyclone Kenneth hit the same area. So some really uh, intense types of storms Earlier this year, we had cyclone Amphan that hit uh, uh, the western coast of India. And again, very intense, uh, uh, rapidly developing storms. Um, and then one of the things that we need to recognize is the way climate change is affecting the world, it's happening everywhere, but there are some profound shifts that are happening in certain parts of the globe. And one of the things that we know is that the poles are warming really fast. Uh, so we are seeing Arctic sea ice extent uh, really diminish. And some might think, well, that's really far away. Why should that matter to me? But what happens in those northern latitudes has really important effects on weather patterns all the way down uh, to the equator. It's changing uh, winds. It's changing ocean currents. Uh, it's uh, contributing to sea level rise. So uh, those changes that we're seeing in land-based ice, uh, in uh, uh, ocean ice, are really affecting weather patterns further south. I'm gonna take us back a little bit in time to 2015 when the Paris Agreement uh, was signed. Uh, I had the, the good fortune to be in Paris when uh, the countries of the world came together to sign this uh, agreement. It was considered an incredible breakthrough at the time. You know, We had since 1990 been waiting for this moment when nations would actually, all the nations of the world would come together and make this commitment. And the commitment was a really important one to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two C, try to aim for 1.5 C. This has never been agreed to by so many nations before. And a key part of the Paris Agreement, this is a lot of text on your screen, but the key part of it is this last part that I've highlighted in yellow, which is that for the first time, uh, nations were saying that they wanted to reach essentially net zero emissions uh, by the second half, in the second half of the century. And we'll see a little bit later that uh, the latest science is saying we really need to get there by 2050. But on the basis of equity and in the context of sustainable development and efforts to eradicate poverty, and that's really critical. This goes back to the equity question uh, that I mentioned in the beginning. We're not going to solve climate change if we make it a trade-off between people's well-being and tackling carbon emissions. We have to be thinking about doing these things together, especially in places in the world where people are living in poverty, 
haven't even had access to modern forms of energy, or haven't had access to um, uh, electricity, haven't even contributed to, to the carbon emissions that are driving the climate change we're seeing right now. So we don't just need to cut emissions, we need to make sure that we're uh, ensuring a good quality of life for everybody around the world. Uh, and, and in Paris, nations uh, also asked the IPCC to uh, do a special report on looking at the impacts of climate change uh, at 1.5 C and 2 C above pre-industrial levels, as well as uh, pathways to stay uh, below that. And this graph on the right, uh, that report was released in 2018, by the way. And uh, the graph on the right shows you an uh, illustrative pathway uh, set of pathways that the IPCC proposed uh, based on existing uh, research of ways to stay uh, below 1.5 C. And you can see that the critical insight from there is that we have to get global carbon dioxide emissions to net zero by around 2050. And now the equity part of this puzzle is of course that there are nations like the United States uh, that have contributed a disproportionate amount of the carbon emissions that are in the atmosphere right now driving climate change. And for them, they must uh, be ahead of the global curve in terms of cutting emissions. They must do much more and much faster. And the IPCC talks about reaching about 45% below 2010 CO2 emission levels by 2030. And here in the United States, uh, groups like ours are advocating for the US to be on the high end of that curve. So on the order of 50% or uh, below uh, 2005 levels by 2030 uh, as a key piece of the contribution. Now that's not enough. Uh, the United States will have to do a lot more, including contributing to uh, finance and technical help to uh, bring down emissions in other parts of the world, as well as contribute to helping nations cope with the impacts of climate change that are already locked in. This is a global challenge and we're not gonna solve it unless countries come together to cooperate. And why do we need to do this? Well, the IPCC 1.5C report also pointed out the very, very serious risk of breaching 1.5C and 2C. Uh, this graphic is a classic uh, burning embers type of graphic that just shows you uh, at different temperature increases. If you look on the left, uh, you see the 1C, the 1.5, and the 2C. Uh, and the, the shades of color there show uh, the intensity of impacts. Uh, so as we go towards the yellow, we have a very, very high risk of uh, severe impacts. Uh, and the IPCC looked across a range of impacts, everything from uh, effects on coral reefs uh, to flooding, uh, to heat-related morbidity and mortality. And you can see that as we breach the 1C threshold, those risks are already going up. So right now we're at about a 1C, about uh, pre-industrial levels, and uh, those risks are already starting to get locked in. But every fraction of a degree we can avoid matters. So that's why uh, 1, 1.5, 2C, these are not cliffs where it's, uh, you just fall off the other side. Every fraction of a degree we can avoid matters. And so what, what we need to do right now is pretty clear. We have to cut emissions, absolutely. Net zero by 2050 is not before. But unfortunately, we've locked in uh, impacts already. And that means we have to invest in adaptation measures, climate resilience to help keep people safe. Um, when it comes to cutting emissions, uh, this is a place where we've known for a long time what the solutions are. Uh, they are the ones you might imagine. We have to make sure that we're uh, wrapping up energy efficiency. We've got to decarbonize electricity by switching to renewable zero carbon forms of electricity. And the good news there is right now, pretty much everywhere in the world, there are incredible renewable energy resources that have not yet been fully ex exploited. Um, and also the cost of these renewable energy technologies are coming down so rapidly. We've seen on the order of double digit uh, cost declines over the last 10 years in wind, solar. And what that means is that in most places, they're cheaper to install than conventional forms of fossil fuel uh, energy. Coal is on the retreat in many places in the world, including in the United States. We've seen an incredible shift away from coal in the last 10 years, also in parts of Europe. 
But at the same time, we are still seeing uh, new coal-fired power plants uh, being built uh, in some parts of the world, um, like India, like China. And what we have to do is make sure that as we're leaning into a future of a clean energy economy, that we're switching away from these fossil fuels, not just to address climate change, but also to address the profound public health problems they pose. Burning coal is one of the dirtiest forms of generating energy creates a lot of particulate matter uh, pollution, for example, which kills, frankly. Um, we've got to electrify as many en energy end users as possible. That means electric cars, electrifying building energy use, electrifying industrial energy use. And even so, we're going to have to invest in technologies that are not yet proven at scale, like carbon capture and storage. Um, like carbon dioxide removal, which uh, can take the form of natural means, uh, like expanding uh, the carbon storage in our soils and vegetation and trees and forests, and uh, investing in R&D around technological means for carbon dioxide removal, which are still unproven and a long way from being uh, commercialized. Again, uh, it's important to recognize that climate change is not just uh, an environmental problem. It has very, very significant effects on public health. This is just one uh, graphic from the CDC here in the US showing some of the different ways in which climate is affecting health. Um, you can see in the center, uh, as CO2 levels rise, we see rising temperatures, more extreme weather, sea level rise, other kinds of impacts. And those on that outer ring there are uh, connected with and intersecting with other challenges so that we get, again, this threat multiplier effect, whether it's on water quality, air pollution, um, changes in vector ecology, uh, where we have uh, longer seasons and a wider range in where uh, vectors like mosquitoes can survive, for example. And uh, the Lancet has been doing yearly reports now for a few years uh, on looking at the intersection of climate and health. And in, in the report that they did last year in 2019, again, they point out two really important things, that climate is already affecting the health of people around the world, but also that the solutions to climate change can improve the health of people. This transition away from dirty fossil fuels to clean energy can really save lives. How do we think about this in an era of COVID-19? Um, earlier uh, this year, uh, my colleagues and some peers of ours uh, released this uh, comment in Nature of Climate Change, where essentially what we were trying to point out is that uh, we don't get the luxury of one crisis. As I said earlier, COVID-19 is now going to collide with climate impacts in real time. We saw it happen when uh, Cyclone Umfram hit, uh, where millions of people had to be evacuated from the path of that cyclone. But there were concerns about how to shelter them uh, with social distancing and public health guidelines in place. Here in the United States, uh, this weekend and going into the next couple of weeks, there's going to be an incredible multi-day heat wave. And that heat wave is starting in the southwest of the country, uh, in places like Arizona and moving up north. It's going to hit Arizona, Texas, places where COVID-19 is surging, even as this heat wave is breaking out. So how will people be, keep safe? Uh, a lot of the public places that people used to go to stay cool, like malls and movie theaters uh, might be closed. Um, elderly people who are very susceptible to uh, heat-related illnesses are also, of course, at high risk for COVID-19. So for them, the, the safest thing might be to just stay at home, but can they afford the electric bills? Do they have air conditioning? These are all the different ways in which we're gonna see COVID collide uh, with uh, climate impacts. Uh, and this was a map we included as part of that article just pointing out around the world, we have a number of climate impacts that are going to collide with COVID this year. So what have we seen so far this year in terms of uh, how climate change on the uh, and, and heat trapping emissions yeah, are evolving? Sorry, could someone mute please? Um, how are we already seeing changes in emissions as a result of COVID-related uh, shutdowns and uh, economic downturns? This is a map from earlier this year, just looking at the northern part of India, which, which tends to have uh, 
uh, very high airborne particulate matter levels. Uh, the first five maps are previous years, and the last map is the 2020 year uh, from March 31st to April 5th. So that was one week after the lockdown was instituted, as you all remember. And you can see that map, the last map there, uh, with, which shows a really profound uh, plunge in particulate matter uh, uh, pollution. Uh, this, this is a, a line graph showing that same kind of data. I uh, just want to point out here that orange line is uh, the data recording uh, the, the aerosol opt optical depths. Uh, that little surge right uh, before March uh, is from uh, the, the fires uh, from Punjab and other places that, that tend to cause that spike uh, there in the harvest season. But you can see uh, off of that, the line plunges well below the 2016-2019 average. This data is coming from uh, monitoring data from, from NASA. Um, and uh, you can see the quote there from Pavan Gupta saying, I've never seen aerosol uh, values so low in the indo gangetic chain at this time of the year. So is this good news? Well, this is not climate action. What we're seeing right now is a really painful suppression of people's uh, well-being. All of, to protect our public health, we're going into these economic lockdowns, but it is happening in a very harsh way, and it is affecting those who live in poverty disproportionately. So yes, we have to do these things right now because we're in an acute public health crisis, but this is not the long-term solution to climate change. Here on, on this graph, this is uh, data from a study that just came out last week talking about uh, the, the consumption loss, the income loss, the employment loss we've seen around the world. That's the top panel. But on the other hand, we've seen also greenhouse gas reductions, reductions in PM2.5, reductions in sulfur dioxide and NOx emissions. So these are two sides of the coin. Uh, in this moment, we're seeing very, very profound impact from people's um, uh, incomes uh, and, and their ability uh, to, uh, to get out of poverty. It's pushing a lot more people into poverty, in fact. And so this is not the way in which we want to bring about these emission reductions. What we want is a sustained investment, sustained policies that really shift our energy system not just these fleeting cuts in emissions from which we might very likely just bounce back as soon as the public health crisis lifts. What we need is a sustained downward trend to get us on that path to net zero emissions by 2050. COVID-19 is also causing a, a significant hunger crisis. Oxfam just released a report last week again, pointing out that by the end of the year, potentially more people could die from hunger uh, than from the disease itself. So again, this is no way uh, to confront either the climate crisis or frankly the COVID crisis because governments are really failing to protect their people, provide the social safety nets, provide uh, the, the essentials, the food, the shelter, the healthcare, the essentials that people need to get through this public health crisis without causing these kinds of impacts. There are bright spots in different parts of the world. Uh, my parents live in Kerala and they've told me many times about how the government of Kerala is taking a very different approach uh, to dealing with the COVID crisis. But I can tell you here in the United States, it's been a sad, sad story. Many, many people um, you know, out of work, unable to pay bills, uh, hunger is on the rise here in the US, including hunger among children. One of the things that uh, is, is a common element with the COVID crisis and the climate crisis is that in both cases, what we're seeing is that long-standing social, racial inequities that existed in societies are being laid bare in this moment. So here in the US, we've seen a profound, horrifying racial difference in death rates as well as hospital rate, hospitalization rates, just a, a range of outcomes related to COVID-19. We're also seeing higher job loss uh, among people of color particularly African-Americans, Native Americans, and Latino people. Um, and this is a very common theme for those of us who've worked in the space of climate change. It too is a space in which we see disproportionate impacts on communities of color. And for those who've worked in the environmental justice space, which has an even older history than climate justice, 
They have pointed out for a long time that communities of color and those who live in poverty tend to be the most exposed to these kinds of uh, harmful pollutants. So we're not going to solve all these problems if we don't center equity in our solutions. Air, air pollution is linked with higher COVID death rates. There's the science coming out of Harvard University that has pointed this out, 8% uh, higher likelihood of dying if you've had long-term exposure to PM2.5. PM2.5 is very closely associated with our dependence on fossil fuels. So you can see how all these dots are connected. Uh, even in this moment where the COVID crisis is front and center, all these connections to fossil fuels, to the climate crisis. Air pollution, as you know, is a major uh, killer uh, in India, around the world. Uh, we have 7 million deaths from air pollution, indoor and outdoor. And a lot of that outdoor pollution is coming from uh, burning fossil fuels. The indoor air pollution is often coming from burning uh, dirty fuels uh, to cook. And that means that women and children are among those who are highest exposed. So that's the downside, right? Literally people dying and being exposed at a very young age, uh, young children's uh, uh, airways are still developing and they're even more at risk from uh, air pollution. So all the more reason to transition away from fossil fuels, not just to address climate change, but to address these near-term health impacts uh, that people are seeing right now. Just last week, the IEA had a Clean Energy Transition Summit where they brought together 40 ministers, including Minister R.K. Singh from India, uh, who represent 80% of the global energy consumption and carbon emissions. And the topic of conversation was, in this moment, let's not retreat from our investments in clean energy. Uh, there is an economic crisis. The way out of that crisis could be a huge ramp up in investments in clean energy. It can create jobs, it can cut emissions, uh, it'll have a huge public health benefit. The concern though is, are we gonna take that route or are we gonna retreat and go back to business as usual thinking? So this is the moment to really uh, be very sober-minded about what our economic recovery plans look like around the world and making sure that they're climate smart. Here in the US last week, uh, the Rhodium Group released uh, its uh, analysis of where U.S. emissions will be as a result of the COVID crisis. Uh, the line at the top uh, left there is the historical emissions in the U.S. Uh, the top blue line is what was projected pre-COVID. So this is without any new policies. This is just if we go on our current business as usual path. And then they have a three potential economic scenarios depending on how deep and how long lasting uh, the economic crisis is. But you can see in all of those scenarios, we're nowhere near where we need to be by 2030 in terms of cutting emissions. So remember I said earlier, we should be at least 50% below 2005 levels by 2030, and none of these lines get anywhere close to that. So it's pretty clear that just relying on COVID and market trends is not enough. We do need policies. We absolutely have to have concerted investments. And the other thing that's pretty clear is that climate change is connected to all of these broader social challenges that we face around the world. So it's not just about climate resilience and transitioning away from fossil fuels, but it's connected to healthcare, it's connected to housing, it's connected to anti-poverty measures, because people are not going to be in a position to really partake in this clean energy economy, truly have climate resilience, if they're still struggling with long-standing socioeconomic inequities. So this is the challenge we face right now. What should a post-pandemic economy look like? Will governments make the investments that are desperately needed or are they gonna to default to business as usual thinking? Are they gonna put us in this false trade-off between the economy and the environment? No, that's not a false trade-off. We can and should have both. Especially as we see the cost of renewables coming down so dramatically, there is no reason why we should be investing in coal-fired power plants right now. And I urge you all to be part of that change. Just by having these kinds of webinars, I can see that you're already very motivated. Uh, be part of that change wherever you are, whether it's educating others, writing op-eds in your local newspaper, uh, putting pressure on your policymakers, voting, running for office yourself. Uh, remember that this climate change is not going to be solved in a corner. It is connected to all the things people care about in their daily lives, the air they breathe, 
uh, the clean water, the availability of that water. So the entry point where you live could be not climate, it could be something else. It could be the water crisis that you're facing. Um, it could be the heat wave uh, that's causing tremendous public health burdens in your communities. Uh, reach out to people where they are and bring them into uh, solving this climate crisis because it is gonna help us solve many other things. Uh, so for me, uh, there are many reasons I do this work, uh, and I have two young children. They are a big part of the reason why I care about um, climate change and the kind of future we're leaving uh, to our kids and grandkids. Uh, my son is a young climate activist himself, and uh, he gave me permission to share uh, from a speech that he wrote and uh, has given at a local climate strike here where we live. And uh, the first time I heard this, I, I felt a combination of, of, uh, of such pride that my son at his young age uh, was a, knew all these things and, and was advocating, but also profound sadness that young children today have to be doing things like this because adults like us have failed to take the actions that we knew were necessary and important decades ago. So we've run out of time for justifying any kind of inaction, any politically convenient excuse, uh, something about our economic well-being right now, which is trading off a few dollars today for our children's entire future. It's not worth it. It's a false trade-off, and it's not one that we should force on our children and grandchildren. I know you have young children in your lives, so think about them as you do this work. Um, and really, it's what we're called to do right now. The climate crisis is connected to a number of different crises. Uh, we can solve these together if we make the right investments in clean energy and in climate resilience, um, and the time to do it is now. So I'm going to stop uh, sharing my screen now and hopefully having a chance to engage in dialogue with all of you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I will start with some of the questions that we have from on the Zoom chat here. Uh, one of the questions, so one uh, aspect of climate change and addressing climate change is that it is too big. It seems too big a challenge. And uh, like you talked about a lot of policy changes that need to be put in place. Uh, so then that can lead to well, the government, my government, your government, governments at the policy level, someone out there should do something. Uh, what would you say to individual level choices that we can make to address climate change? Well, you know, I'm going to start by uh, an adage that I think we all know wherever in the world we uh, are, which is that, uh, you know, frankly, most politicians are cowards. They lead from behind. So what you need is the people putting pressure on them, the constituents raising their voices, for what the kinds of changes that they want and holding their feet to the fire. They're not going to do this, uh, wake up one fine morning and do it just because. We have to explain why this matters and why it's connected to things that we care about, like the economy, like our health, uh, like our children's futures. Um, so climate change is both about things that are happening far away and seem out of our control and things happening right in our backyard. And that's, I think, the opportunity enter the conversation in a way that connects with something that's happening locally where you live. Um, and you just need to look around and you, you know what those things are. Is it about planting trees to get more shade so that when we have these extreme heat waves, people are protected? Is it about, it about the work you're doing in a local hospital where you're starting to see more young children coming in with asthma and other breathing difficulties that are being exacerbated by a particular amount of pollution? Uh, there's so many entry points uh, because climate touches everything. So don't feel like you have to solve the whole problem. Uh, none of us can do that. And that's actually the good news. We're in this together. This is a collective challenge. Uh, and we'll only solve it collectively together. Uh, so uh, this topic historically has been rife with conflict. It's just, just not just politicians, but even among the members of public, it's been difficult to accept that this is an issue and it's a real challenge and it affects us all. Why do you think this is, a, why has it been so conflict-ridden? So this is where I think talking about climate change as a problem that has to do with emissions 
uh, makes it too abstract. Yes, it is about heat trapping emissions, uh, but solving this crisis is not just a technical fix. It's not just about uh, installing more wind turbines and solar panels. We're actually talking about socioeconomic shifts. And I think that is the thing that uh, makes people initially scared because uh, we are uh, embedded in a business as usual status quo way of thinking about our economy and thinking about those kinds of shifts feel intimidating. But I wanna ask you, is our economy today actually serving people? We're seeing such widening inequality. We're seeing hunger. We're seeing a lack of access to basic essentials like healthcare. Um, so in this moment, uh, why wouldn't we wanna embrace a different version of the future where we have an economy that actually is just equitable and serves the real needs of people, not just uh, GDP growth, but actually who's benefiting? In fact, do we need endless GDP growth or do we just need a more equitable sharing of what we have? So I think it's those kinds of shifts. And um, I also wanna be very clear that these, it is not by accident that we've seen conflict. Uh, fossil fuel companies and their allies have sowed a lot of this conflict. They're using their big pockets and their profits to ensure that governments continue to subsidize coal and other fossil fuels. Um, they have spread climate uh, uh, science disinformation for decades now. They have lobbied against uh, policies here in the US and around the world. So uh, this is no accident that we find ourselves, for example, in the US in a very politically polarized partisan uh, state of affairs around the climate science. That didn't happen by accident. There, there are people with deep profit motives, short-term profit motives, who are trying to keep us entrenched in this fossil fuel world. So a uh, frightening thought here. What, what does it mean if he, if with Trump and White House for climate change, the future of technical oh. climate change becomes wide? <laughs> I'm going to start by saying we're a nonpartisan um, organization uh, here in the US. Our uh, nonprofit status uh, is associated with being nonpartisan. Um, but uh, it has been uh, really uh, scary to see uh, the Trump administration over the last three and a half years pretty much decimate any type of climate policy, that any kind of environmental policy that we had in place. They rolled back so many environmental protections, uh, so much of our uh, climate policies at a moment where we have no time to waste and where the US in particular has such great responsibility to act. Um, so yes, uh, wherever you are in the world, elections matter. Um, voting for people who accept the science and are willing to take advice from experts about what to do really, really matters, not just at the national level, but at state and local elections as well. So uh, coming now to the, uh, the, the connection between COVID-19 and climate change. Uh, we, uh, so there is the fact that these two crises are connected, but there is also the fact that because of COVID-19, now there is excessive use of PPEs, personal protective equipment. Can that compound the already present challenges that we had from pollution from addressing climate change? Look, the reality is that we are in an acute public health crisis and there are some things that we just have to do to help keep people safe and alive and to help frontline workers who are uh, absorbing a lot of the risk uh, to keep the rest of us safe. Uh, so while they might be, uh, you know, uh, in this moment, there might be an excessive uh, waste stream that's being created. Uh, I would argue that we not get hung up on these short term uh, things that are going to pass. We are hopefully going to have a vaccine. We're going to get through this public health crisis uh, but when we are on the other side of it, the longer term trend issues that we're dealing with, the climate change piece hasn't gone away. And that uh, addressing that crisis is not about any one year. So for example, this uh, in the first quarter of this year, we saw about a 25% decrease in heat trapping emissions uh, from places like China, for example. But that's not a long term trend. That's just a short term uh, dip and as we come out of this crisis we will see emissions go back again just like we saw after the 2008-2009 economic crisis unless we 
implement policies and investments that put us on a different track. Um, so I would worry less about the really short-term challenges here related to PPE uh, and the waste streams and worry more about the long-term trends that we really need to get our arms around. Good point, yeah. So this is a question from our, one of the audience at Facebook. Uh, she's asking, could increasing occurrence of pandemics due to climate change lead to a feedback regulation? Well, this is one of the truly scary things about climate change. You know, people uh, get complacent thinking it's about just, you know, temperatures slowly going up. But the reality is that there are serious nonlinear uh, effects with climate change as temperatures increase. And one of those uh, feedback loops is around uh, ice sheet loss, uh, because as uh, we start to see the ice sheet loss, it, it becomes easier uh, for the ice to melt and we we'll, we'll lock in sea level rise over decades and centuries as land-based ice uh, melts. So uh, we really do have, as we're seeing, for example, uh, temperatures, these heat waves in Siberia and uh, the fires that are burning there, uh, when they, if they start to burn peat, uh, we will have such profound releases of methane uh, and CO2 as well that uh, can really trigger uh, a runaway amounts of uh, accumulation of peat trapping gases. Now, this is not going to happen overnight. It's, of course, a, a long, over a long period of time. But once you start the process, you can't put the brakes on for some of these types of impacts. Um, and when it comes to vector-borne diseases, uh, the reality is right now we're seeing in many parts of the world, uh, because of the changes in seasons, uh, lengthening of the warmer periods uh, and uh, the, the colder periods getting shorter and less intense, we have uh, cases where there, the season for these vector-borne diseases is, is lengthening. Uh, we also have the potential for an additional life cycle. So here in the US, we're seeing tick-borne diseases uh, on the rise and ticks now have the opportunity because of the longer or warmer months to have an additional life cycle than they were able to prior to climate change. So remember there are many contributing factors. Our development choices are also affecting these vector borne diseases, how much, how our cities develop, how we have standing water and paved surfaces and all of those things. Uh, so climate is not the sole driver, but it's a very important contributor uh, to these uh, impacts. We do have to worry about these feedback loops and threshold effects. So one of the challenges uh, is in India. So looking from the, the point of view here is that uh, countries in the West have burned fossil fuel for like 50 years. They've advanced themselves. And now India is facing the and other countries like India who are up and coming and just catching up on to the economic uh, development are faced with the burden of that uh, the fossil fuel emission. Plus, you have the fact that any country in the history has not been able to advance themselves without also increasing their own energy. So there is pre present challenges plus the burden of the past. And there is a sense that, that that leads to resistance among people to accept climate change. Well, it's not our doing. It's We're facing because of other choices and so on. Uh, how would you address that? How should we move past this? Well, that is straight up the truth. There's, this is a, such an unfair situation where uh, many, many uh, people around the world who've contributed the least to these emissions that have accumulated in the atmosphere, who have benefited the least uh, from uh, the burning of fossil fuels and now being told, um, sorry, that window is closed and uh, you, you cannot have your share. Uh, and this is why I think it's a profoundly immoral stance on the part of countries like the United States not to own up to their responsibility, take very strong measures domestically to cut their emissions, but also help other countries with the technical resources and finances to make that clean energy transition. So yes, it's profoundly unfair. And the reality is we're all going to suffer if we all don't take action. So uh, this is a case where countries like India, China, uh, these developed countries in, in Africa and around the world, they have to uh, face the, the, the reality that failing to take action and curtail emissions, allowing emissions to rise uh, unchecked is gonna end up hurting their own citizens. So we can have energy, we can have energy services and we can get them from renewable forms of energy. That is 
the choice we face right now. Yes, energy is very closely tied to economic uh, development. Let's make sure that energy is coming from renewable sources. And India is profoundly lucky in the sense that it has so much renewable energy potential. Solar, wind, offshore wind uh, uh, can be uh, a big part too. Uh, biogas, there, there's just incredible resources. It's a, there's a really important moment where we can get people access to modern forms of energy who may not be able to get grid connected. Uh, not everyone is going to get grid connected electricity, but you can have these localized small scale microgrid uh, with a renewable spared with energy storage wherever in the country you are. So it's actually an opportunity here where people have been, even in India, shut out of this energy revolution that has benefited the richer parts of society. Uh, how can we bring that to everybody? So on one hand, this is about nations. Uh, uh, one nation versus the other is, is how it's been portrayed. But it's really about people even within nations because everywhere in the world, the elites are responsible for a greater amount of the carbon emissions and our, uh, the, the lives of those who've lived in poverty can be greatly improved if we provide cleaner forms of energy. Um, I, I continue to think that venues like the UNFCCC forum where countries of the world come together uh, to talk about climate action need to be used to put pressure on developed countries to do the right thing, uh, cut their emissions, help other nations make the clean energy transition. And you know what's more? Pay for the climate impacts that have locked in right now, because those climate impacts are causing tremendous human misery and costs in countries all around the world. Um, they should help pay. Uh, for uh, recovery from those kinds of disasters because they are the responsibility of emissions from the developed world. How, uh, in, in terms of, like you said, uh, shifting the uh, forms of energy, uh, are there uh, plans or discussions somewhere to for sharing green technology with up and coming economies like India? Yeah, so actually, I mean, India is in a very interesting situation because India actually has a lot to share with the rest of the world because these uh, cost declines in renewable energy that I talked about earlier have come about in large part because of uh, the cheap manufacturing that countries like China and India have been able to do to help bring down the cost of things like solar panels. Um, so actually, India is in a great position to share and is part of a global solar consortium around sharing these uh, technologies, including uh, in places in Africa, in Latin America. Um, and there is a huge uh, economic opportunity here for India, too, because it can be part of that global export chain uh, to create uh, and, sh and sell these technologies. To my mind, it brings uh, the connection with COVID again, because India is going to be on the forefront of manufacturing the vaccines uh, that are going to eventually help us uh, overcome this public health crisis. There's no doubt uh, with the manufacturing base and the scientific expertise that India has, it is on the forefront of being able to uh, be part of that. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, uh, that with the resources and the technical expertise that India has, it really is, the, the future is bright. You know, it, it can be a leader in this space. It already is a leader in renewable energy technologies, but can do so much more uh, if there is political will. And also if there is will to head off the fossil fuel interests, like the coal interests, uh, because they're also very powerful in India still. Um, so here, another, another question from uh, our audience at Facebook. Is climate change reversible and does this reversibility depend on the focus of renewable energy resources? Yeah, so unfortunately, climate change is not like your oven dial where you can just sort of tone down the temperature. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions in, accumulate in the atmosphere and, and last for a century or more. Um, so uh, the the reality is that the emissions that we have already accumulated in the atmosphere are going to continue to have profound effects uh, for a while to come. And that's why cutting them as quickly as possible, it's the cumulative emissions that matter, cutting them as quickly as possible is really, really important so we stop adding to the problem. Also cutting uh, other climate forces like methane. Uh, methane is a very potent heat trapping gas and it can drive very quick changes if we don't um, 
curtail our emissions of methane associated with natural gas, for example, and agricultural operations. Um, so most of the, many of the climate impacts we're seeing right now are not reversible, but they can be limited. And that's why it's important because everything we're seeing right now, the sea level rise we're seeing right now, the heat waves, um, with unchecked climate change, they will worsen tremendously. But if we curtail our emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, in line with what the IPCC 1.5C report showed, uh, get to net zero by 2050, we can really curtail the pace and magnitude of uh, some of these worsening climate impacts. Heat waves in particular are very sensitive uh, to changes. And so we can see some really immediate uh, amelioration if we got our emissions in terms of reducing uh, the extent of the kinds of heat waves we'll see. Sea level rise is harder. It's a slow moving disaster, unfortunately, that we have baked in for uh, uh, decades, if not centuries right now. Um, so the zero emissions in 2050 that you mentioned, uh, considering the uh, rate of progress of things since the Paris Agreement, do you think it's reachable, sustainable? I mean, uh, is it is practical to aim for that. So here's what I will say. It's technologically feasible and there's enough uh, modeling and solutions, practical solutions uh, that has been done around the world to show that uh, the problem here is not technology. We have most of the technologies it would take and then we have enough time for R&D to develop the last bits of technology that we might need or to bring down the costs of technology. What's lacking is political will. That's, that's been the profound challenge from the very beginning. Uh, so even after the Paris Agreement has been signed, as, as we all know, global emissions have continued to rise uh, at best hold steady. Um, this year we might see about a 6% drop, but it's likely to be a temporary drop, of course, and it's not going to affect the cumulative emissions. Uh, so from a climate perspective, it's in the noise. Uh, we need a sustained uh, drop in emissions. And uh, the, the challenge, and this is why I think bringing social scientists into the conversation is really, really important because we're talking about a socioeconomic shift, not just a techno shift. Uh, and uh, the political will piece for me is, it's like a log jam. If we get enough of the major emitters to start moving, the dominoes will fall. And this is why it's really important to have conversations uh, between the US, Europe, China, India, all of these countries who are on the vanguard of developing the technologies and the solutions, but also have uh, rising emissions uh, right now. We really need to get out of our corners and see this as a cooperative challenge problem, not a zero sum game. Um, but thus far it's been the political will that's been lacking. And uh, with, I, I do think what we're seeing shift though in the world right now is we have a really strong uh, diverse movement for climate action. So young people for sure, who are part of the global climate strikes uh, but also in different parts of the world, we're seeing the labor movement, the environmental justice movement, uh, faith leaders, businesses uh, sort of come together and say, we're part of this movement. And I think that's what it'll take. It's a social tipping point issue. And once that happens, things can move very quickly. Uh, so that's the shift that we're trying and working towards here. And here in the United States, uh, in the lead up to the election and beyond, that's the shift that we're trying to make on the ground. The climate movement is not just about climate scientists, but all of these diverse sets of people. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of diverse sets of people, uh, there's another question from our audience at Facebook who uh, asking that uh, with climate deniers all around us, how to maintain nonpartisan approach, how to approach this topic in a nonpartisan way uh, when talking with people from the opposite side. Ah, oh, so frustrating. <laughs> the people who are still denying the science. Um, so two things I'd say about that. First, just going back to something I said earlier, this is not an accident. It's not just belief. I don't believe the science. Uh, when you hear that, uh, it, it's worth thinking about the people who have sowed uh, the misinformation and why they have done it. Uh, it's because of their profits, uh, their concern about uh, 
uh, shift away from fossil fuels affecting their business bottom line. And they have tried to really uh, ensure that our political system that is gummed up, that the works are gummed up and slowed down so that we're not taking climate action and we're questioning the science, even as the impacts are becoming ever more evident in the world around us. Uh, it is ridiculous to still be questioning basic science that has been clear now for over a century. Um, so uh, how do you talk to people? Well, I think climate is no different than most other things where people have strong opinions. Uh, it could be who's your favorite cricket team? Um, how do you enter a conversation like that? Well, it's by finding common ground, uh, whatever that common ground is, and in an authentic way. Uh, People see through you when you're making up stuff. So enter where you feel comfortable and where there's common ground. And for me, that's very often been uh, about talking about impacts in people's backyards. Have they noticed things? Are they noticing changes? And I've had conversations in uh, so-called red states here in the US where people don't wanna call it climate change, but they do know that they're seeing more flooding in the streets, uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, um, they're seeing these intensifying, rapidly intensifying hurricanes. Uh, they're seeing prolonged heat waves. They may not want to put the climate label on it, but they know those things are happening. And so that's the entry point for the conversation then. Oh, so it's, the, it's, it's flooding. So what does that look like? What have you noticed? Um, for some people, it really is about uh, their economic well-being. You know, People are worried about daily life concerns. How do I put food on the table? You're talking to me about some abstract climate change thing and I'm trying to feed my kids. Okay, well, have the conversation. Can we have climate policies that actually are helping improve people's jobs and lives? Uh, this is why engaging with the labor movement here in the US has been really, really important because we have to center people's daily lives concerns. Are people noticing things in their children? Are they seeing worsening asthma? Are they seeing more visits to the doctor? Maybe that's the entry point of concern for a parent uh, rather than something abstract like climate. But I guess that's all I would say. People are people, they're human beings. Um, we apply labels to them and it uh, makes it impossible to talk past those labels. Uh, but all of us need to get out of our comfort zone here. Um, even the so-called liberals who always have believe the science, we need to get out of our comfort zone because talking to each other isn't gonna change uh, the broader social context here. Yeah, that, that actually brings me to a, another question here is that it's still a, if we're, like you said, for, even among the believers, it's still a discussion, among, it's an elitist discussion. It's not entered the mainstream, it has not entered public consciousness. So uh, the reason you think is because we're stuck in concepts like we're talking about emissions, but we're not relating it to everyday life. That's exactly it. Uh, you know, I would say that uh, when I first started doing this work, even in the environmental movement uh, here in the US, if you started to talk about equity or uh, jobs or environmental justice, people were like, yeah, that's important, but we're talking about climate change right now. Yeah. And it's taken a while for people to uh, absorb the fact that well, you just said climate touches everything. Then how, how are you on the other hand saying everything doesn't touch climate? You know, it's, it's, it's all connected. And that's the challenge. I think for people who've been in the climate movement for a long time, are you really looking at it as an intersectional problem? Are you bringing it to people's daily lives? Or are you still in your elite ivory tower bubble where you're talking about uh, cumulative GHG emissions in the atmosphere that you can measure to a tenth of, uh, a decimal point precision, because that is very, very important, believe me, and I'm glad there's scientists who do that. But uh, we're not gonna see change in the policy world uh, unless we recognize how it connects with people's lives. Um, and right now, people in many places are worried about the economy and feel like uh, the economy really needs to come back and uh, climate is a challenge for another day. But this is where pointing out that we can have an economic recovery that creates a lot of jobs if we invest in clean energy. Uh, you know, if we ramp up energy efficiency and renewables as part of our economic recovery plan, if we invest in mass transit, uh, electric vehicles, this can all be part of economic recovery. It's standard textbook economic recovery. You invest, right? Uh, governments invest. 
let's choose what we're investing in. Let's make sure it's climate smart. Let's not throw uh, money down the drain, investing more in uh, reinforcing fossil fuel dependence. So it, the recent conference that happened, uh, you said, was that the sense there was that there is acceptance of implementing and such policies? Well, I think there's there's still a lot of uh, divergence of views. Uh, I think people on on uh, one level accept the premise, but are really worried when they go back home. How do they talk to the public about an economic recovery plan uh, that is also doing this shift? Uh, they think that people will want to go back to business as usual. But I guess what I would say is uh, we've lost business as usual. If nothing else, COVID-19 has pointed out to us how flimsy business as usual even was to begin with. And all of the things that we're seeing now, uh, many of the seeds of them were already there. They were just hidden. You know, uh, Who is going to be worst affected by a crisis like this? Those seeds were already there in our societies, in our economic systems. And so we need to do better. We just, we, we cannot go default to an economic system that wasn't serving the interests of people. So uh, as an economist, do you think that stricter carbon pricing policies could help nudge the abatement in the right direction in the post COVID world? And who are the players to enforce this? Yeah, I've always thought carbon pricing is an important tool. It's a powerful tool. Um, it's not a silver bullet though. I, I think um, it isn't uh, going to be enough on its own. And it's because uh, a market-based approach to solving climate change uh, doesn't get around a whole range of market failures that we face right now. Everything from subsidies for fossil fuels um, to the fact that we don't have enough R&D on clean energy technologies we don't invest enough in energy efficiency. We're, we're wasting energy uh, right now uh, because there's some small upfront cost to invest in energy efficiency and people aren't able to afford those. So if we invest in those, uh, make those upfront costs affordable, many more people will be able to take those measures. Uh, we're not incentivizing in the way we build our cities and plan our cities, we're not incentivizing low carbon growth, smart growth that has uh, compact uh, uh, living areas where people can walk, uh, where people aren't driving miles and stuck in traffic. There are a whole lot of interconnected pieces here uh, that don't get addressed simply by a carbon price. Uh, it, we do need to be thinking about all, uh, a suite of policies that together will get us to this low carbon world. Uh, in terms of a carbon price, I think one of the important things to recognize is that what we do with the revenues is really important. Uh, we need to make sure that we're using those revenues first and foremost to address any disproportionate energy uh, cost impact on people who are uh, living in poverty or, or low-income folks. Um, we have to make sure that we're investing in renewables in this transition using those carbon revenues. So the policy design is really critical. Uh, it's, just, it's not just carbon price for the heck of a carbon price, but how we design it, who's at the table when we're designing it um, is important. Right. So uh, actually here in India, uh, recently, the government has cleared a large amount of coal mining to private parties. So that from what you're saying, it sounds like, I mean, there is the green technology, like you say, and there's a lot of it there, but then stuff like this can actually send us back, maybe worse off than where we are, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I mean, I think that uh, the market is not a neutral party here. The market can be manipulated in different ways. Uh, we would like to orient the market to value clean energy, to value uh, reductions in carbon emissions, to put a price on the enormous climate impacts that are associated with those carbon emissions so that we're making smart choices from consumption to production. But we have other actors in the market who are manipulating it in the opposite direction to keep coal fired power online longer, um, to uh, incentivize a huge rush to natural gas, which Natural gas burns cleaner than coal for sure, and it has a part to play. But in a country like the United States, uh, this is a, a, a really big risk now because we're just shifting from one fossil fuel to another. Uh, natural gas comes with methane emissions as well. And it's gonna lock in the kind of infrastructure that has us being dependent on fossil fuels, pipelines, et cetera, 
for a long time to come. So I think in some countries it can play an important bridging role and it can really help lower local air pollution um, that comes from burning fossil fuels. But in a country like the United States, this is the wrong moment um, to indulge this rush to gas. So uh, we're nearing at the end of our hour. Uh, so I want to thank you again, Rachel, for joining us today. It's really early in your morning. So that's doubly thank you for joining us. Uh, any uh, closing words that you would like to say to our participants here? Well, I mean, I just firstly just really want to thank you for inviting me. I, I was so excited to get the invitation. Um, I, I grew up in Delhi. And uh, as I said, my parents live in Kochi. I, I was back there uh, over Christmas and the New Year. So I, I um, a lot of my work here is in, in the US and it's US focused, but I, it's, it's really a privilege to have a chance to engage with all of you. Um, and I, I just want to uh, commend you for getting this group stood up so quickly. And, and the, I was looking at some of your previous webinars uh, earlier this weekend. It's, it's really amazing. So just that cliche, all it takes is a group of committed people. So don't underestimate what you all are doing here and what you can do uh, going forward. Uh, it, it just really the bright spot in my day today <laughs> to start the day like this. So thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, this is uh, a weekly series. So please join us for our next uh, session next Sunday. Uh, just one quick announcement. Also, we have, uh, like, as the situation with COVID has evolved, uh, ISRC's response has also evolved with it. Um, so we uh, currently, one of the things we're doing is exa critically examining the curricular cuts that the CBSE has announced. Uh, if you're a teacher and you would like to volunteer for this effort, please email us or get in touch with us with, uh, through any of our social media channels. Uh, uh, Jam, uh, anything to add or sh before we close? You're mute. Jam, you're on mute. No, just to thank Rachel once again. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.